Hey, so grab your Bible. We're going to go ahead and get started here. I'm so excited about this new series that we're diving into as we look at preparing, getting ready, living in this new normal. You know, this last series, if you've been with us, we said that in the midst of a changing world where things are constantly changing, there's one thing that doesn't change. If you are in Christ, you're loved by him. You, you are approved completely. You're totally accepted, fully loved, fully loved by him. You know, the way that you know if your core identity is something that is unshakable, if it's found in God and Him alone, the way you determine that is when you walk through seasons or times, circumstances out of your control. When your life is disrupted by things that you cannot control, you'll discover where you place and find your worth. And what I want to do today is look at what it is to live a life that's set on, a, on the faithfulness of God. Because here's the truth, look at this, a completely disruptive new normal has arrived without invitation. Now we all know this, we've all experienced together what has happened among us and now people are responding in different ways. We're starting to you know, open up a little bit, we're starting to move back, here I am on campus, praise God. But I'm watching people who are like, hey, I'm done with this, let's go. And then others who say, hey, I'm, 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 no, 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 not yet. And then still others are saying, hey, I'm ready for a brand new life altogether. Now, most of us, I think, man, let, get me back to my life pre-corona days. Uh, I just want my life to be normal, like it always has been. A lot of us, in fact, have a bias toward the past. We've always lived that way. I just want my life to be predictable. I want it to be secure. I want it to go back exactly the way it always has been. Well, one thing is certain. The new normal is uncertainty. Everything has changed, and I think things have changed really in some ways forever. It was uh, John Paulus. He's a mathematician who deals in probabilities and logic and he wrote this, uncertainty is the only certainty there is. And knowing how to live with insecurity is the only security that there is. You know, you might say, man, that sounds pessimistic, Jeff. But instead, that's rather biblical. See, the only thing that doesn't change is change. And I think it's because in life, God wants us to know and to learn that he is the one who's faithful. He's the one who never changes. See, this is the God we encounter in the Bible, isn't it? He's the God who, who, who confronts faithless people like me, like you, and then remains faithful, always faithful, always in control. He never changes. And though there are many examples in life uh, and many examples in the Bible, we're going to focus in on one man who experienced the faithfulness of God when his life was disrupted in a way that is unthinkable. And we find a story in the book that bears his name. I want you to turn again to Daniel, the book of Daniel. We're going to start in chapter one today as we think about preparing for a new normal. See, what do you hold on to when you're forced into a new normal? What do you hold on to when you're uh, thrust into a foreign land, a place you've never been, into a season that you've never experienced before? What happens when you experience uh, loss, a radical shift in your life? Today, I want you to, I want to encourage you to hold on to your identity. You need to hold on to your provider and you need to hold on to your purpose. We're going to look and see how is it that we can remain faithful to God because he's always faithful to us. So Daniel chapter one, verse one. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now this one verse places the whole book in context. So I wanna, I wanna spend a moment here. This is the turning point in Israel's history. You know, the, the Babylonians had taken over the Assyrians as the world power in that time it's six, in 605 B.C. And then what we're going to see is a 30-month siege of Jerusalem. 
uh, after uh, the, the, the Babylonians had come in and taken over the area there, the whole region, they were the power of the world. And, and it took place this 30 month siege from 589 BC all the way to, to the all out destruction of Jerusalem in 587, 86. BC. Many believe that Daniel and his friends were taken out very early on, but the people there were in quarantine for those many years. And, and even in those months in particular, they were, they were sheltering away, even to a point where they had no food. Many were starving. You can read the story in 2 Kings. You can read about the destruction of Jerusalem in Jeremiah's Lamentations. And, and so we see a people who are devastated. We see a country that is under siege. And many of us feel that way in these days. A pandemic has placed us kind of under siege. Now, praise God, we're not under a military siege, but even lately we've been under siege. We have seen violence, division in our country. Some of us have even been under curfews this week. You know, we live in a time and we lament over the division and the violence in our nation. And we're going to see that God's faithfulness to Daniel in exile calls us out to be faithful to him as well. But this is not a story about Daniel's faith, not ultimately. Many of us approach the Bible and, and we can teach our kids this way. We teach uh, our teenagers or even adults. We say, hey, be like Daniel, right? We read a story, be like David, crush your giants. Be like Moses, be like, you know, we, be like Esther. A and then we realize we really can't be. Now, I thank God that people in the Bible whom he used, they have real stories. I mean, it, it didn't wash over the sins of those who were in places of great influence. Daniel is an amazing person that we find in the Bible. In fact, many scholars think, man, is this guy for real at all? Because he remains faithful. But the story's not about Daniel. The story's about a faithful God who's always there for us. Because you see, you may not be able to be like Daniel. But you do have a God who is able, like Daniel. See, we have the same God. And so the Bible is not teaching us ultimately to get better, work harder, but to, but to believe more deeply in a God who's always faithful. And so I want you to see that, that the first thing we see, Daniel in exile is taken out. But I want you to see why he's taken out, because God is faithful even in his judgment. You see, God is faithful to execute his judgment on Judah, just as he promised that he would. Look at verse 2. And the Lord gave, look at that, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand, with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. This was promised in Leviticus, the covenant was promised. And he said, you, you be faithful to me. I'll always be faithful to you, but you must follow after me. Keep your end of this covenant. And if a nation, they would keep his commands, then he would remain faithful and they would be all good with their great God. But instead, they continue to turn away from him over and over again. But he's gracious. He keeps calling them back. You can read the details of this covenant that's made in Leviticus chapter 26. But Israel, Judah, repeatedly failed on their end of the covenant. And so God continued to be gracious and continued to, to, to call out to them through his prophets to call them back to him. And yet they turned away and there was no other way for him to continue to draw them to repentance except to send them into exile. Babylon comes in and we see uh, this prophesied even uh, in, in Isaiah's prophecy in 2 Kings 20, verse 18, it says this, And some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in a palace of the king of Babylon. Now, eunuchs, the Hebrew word can mean servants. We don't know if Daniel and his friends were actually eunuchs, but they were certainly servants of the king. That's why they were brought to Babylon, as we'll see in a moment. But can you imagine this? They must have thought this is a hundred years prior to this. And Isaiah is saying, here's what's going to happen. They, they would have said, what? Are you kidding me? Can you imagine someone? I suppose it's happened. Someone comes to us and says, hey, uh, you may not know this, but here, listen, here's what's going to happen to America. Your sons and daughters are going to be pulled out. 
their freedoms are going to be taken away from them. We'd say, what are you talking about? And yet, just at the beginning of this year, if you might remember New Year's Eve, perhaps 2020, moving into a new decade. Yes, a new decade's coming. It's 2020. Everything is up and to the right. I've got 2020 vision. I know exactly where I'm heading. I've set my plans. I know what's going. I, everything is right on track. It's going to be amazing. And then we're three months in and the wheels fall off. There's one thing that is certain. You don't know what's coming. And we see this throughout our lives and we see it here. I, I, I'm not saying this pandemic is the judgment of God upon us. I do think we're experiencing the consequences of America's original sin. Our country's original sin of slavery and racism that continues to, to continue on in our country. And we see this even in our day. We, 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 we no longer, it seems, or we're not holding on to the truth that all men and women are created equal in the eyes of God. And then closer to home, don't think that God won't bring his judgment upon our sin, bring consequences of our sin if we don't turn to him. You see, the backstory of this second king's story of Isaiah is that Hezekiah brought the king of Babylon down to Jerusalem and he came and he showed him the treasures within the temple. He was, what he was doing was he was showing him that they're a, that, you know, Israel would be a helpful and wealthy kind of ally because they had the same enemy, Assyria. And so he had this unholy alliance with Babylon that he was seeking to establish. And Isaiah says, Hey, who is this? And he says, He's the king of Babylon. He says, What have you shown him? He said, I've shown him the treasures of the temple. He said, what, what have you shown? I've shown him everything. And then that's when Isaiah says, No, 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 no. This is an unholy alliance and he condemns Hezekiah. He speaks truth to power and he says judgment is coming. And this is exactly what we're reading in verse two about a hundred years later. But this is not an ancient temptation. Don't miss this. We sacrifice our faith for political or financial gain or businesses, business alliances that, that, that we shouldn't make for our own safety or profit or security. See, we have... We've, we've got to put our families, we've got to put our finances, all of our lives, our businesses, our health in the hands of God. You see, where, where do your commitments, I'd ask, where do your commitments and devotions not align with God's way and his word? Where are your alliances not aligning with the way of Jesus? It's worth thinking about. Repent before it's too late. Because there's a point at which God, by his mercy and his love, will ask, do you want to continue in this sin? Do you want to continue in this pattern of disobedience? Because ultimately God will say, okay, you want to live without me. Let's see how that goes for you. But it's all because of his mercy and his grace to draw us back. The judgment of God upon the people of Israel is the entire story that sets up Daniel and his friends in exile. Now look at this in verse 3. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, his chief official or servant, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility. All right. So they're going to bring Daniel and his friends who are among that group, probably teenagers at the time. It says in verse 4, Youths without blemish, Nebuchadnezzar wanted the very best, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. Now think of the trauma of these teenagers. They, they're, they're, they're pulled out of a bright future and they're at the top of their class. I mean, their senior year, how about it, is stripped away. Our graduates know what this is like. They're taken away, prisoners of war, refugees, displaced into a foreign land. They're going to miss all the rituals and special days that lead them into young adulthood. They're not going to be experiencing graduation. They're not going to be dating. They're not going to go to prom. They're not going to win the sports championship finally. 
weddings or funerals, so many who've missed these moments in these days. But Daniel, his whole world was, was, was turned upside down. See, the future is stripped away, but it's also stripped away for Israel. Think about it. The youngest, the brightest, the best are taken away. All of these leaders, these young leaders are pulled out. And that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar seeks to do. And so in verse 5, the king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. See, they're now supposed to be completely dependent on the king. Think about that. God was the one. He's the one who provides food and water to drink our daily sustenance. But now they're going to depend on the king. And now they're to, to walk through this intense reprogramming of their entire worldview to, to re-identify themselves. Look at this. It says they were to be educated for three years like a graduate program. And at the, at the end of that time, they would stand before the king, meaning they would serve the king. Sounds like college for a lot of us, a reprogramming of the mind. And then the final repurposing of their life. Their names are changed. There's nothing more personally identifying than your name. You see what's happening here. In verse 6, among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them new names. Daniel he called Belshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. Daniel's name would go from God is my judge to Bel or Baal. Bel protect his life. Hananiah would go from Yahweh is gracious to command of Aku, who was the moon god. Mishael would go from, to, to Meshach, who is like God, to whom or who is like Aku. And Azariah, Abednego would go from Yahweh has helped to servant of Nebu, who was the son of Bel, one of their many gods. See, this is their new normal, stripped of everything they had known, and they may have uh, been called these names, but they didn't answer to these names, not really. Because you see, here's what you must hold on to when you find yourself in Babylon, in a new normal. You've got to hold on to your identity. What would you do, alone and scared, a long way from familiar surroundings? How would you cope in a hostile environment what truths would you cling to? What would you hold on to? Would you, would you hold on to your identity in Christ if you are in Him? Or would you assimilate into the culture? Maybe some of you have experienced this before. Again, for some, it's when you leave home. Maybe you go off to college, when you go off to that new job, that first job. And what are the things that you're going to even now leave behind in order to move ahead into this new normal? And what is the world going to demand of you that you not leave behind, but that you enter back into work and world and school and society? What things are you going to hold on to that are no longer worth holding on to? What have you learned in this season that you're not willing now to surrender? Hold on to your identity. And again, if you're in Christ, hold on to your new name. I was lost, but now I'm found. I, I was, I was uh, separated from God, but now I am a beloved son or daughter of the king. Hold on to your new name. I, I was once separated, unforgiven, even condemned. Now I am forgiven. And when Satan wants to give you a new name, you remind him of who you are. When he wants to give you a name of shame, a name of regret, of guilt, you remind him, you say, not today, Satan. That is not my name. I have been given a new name by God. And listen, brothers and sisters, I want to speak to our members and those of you watching, brothers and sisters of color. Don't let anybody, any person give you a new name. Don't let anyone change your name from something that is not equal or, 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 or less than beautiful, powerful, loved and honored. Hold on to the name that God has given you, made in His image, all of us, out of love and for His purpose. 
No human can, uh, can give you another identity. God alone holds that power. Hold on to your identity. And then look, secondly, hold on to your provider. They trust God to provide for them and not the king. They determine to let God be their provider. And this is where the story is set. Look at verse uh, 8 of chapter 1. But Daniel, this is where we see this resolve in Daniel. We see over and over again. And he was this way as a teenager. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. See, to eat and drink with them was essentially to worship with them, to give in and not trust his God. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. Here we see Daniel is resolved, but look, he's made up his mind and he's even wise. He's seeking to, hey, how can we not do this and worship God even in this new normal? Daniel and his, and his friends knew he, who their provider was. Do you know who your provider is? Do you know who's going to pull you out? Do you know who's going to bring us out of this? And are we going to give him praise and glory? Are we going to say, well, good thing our government, our, our, our president or our leaders, our mayor, good thing they're so smart. Good thing we got medicine. Good thing we're so educated. Do we give him credit or do we leave him out? Do you know who your provider is? What does your loss, your grief through this time reveal about you? You see, when, when, when our roles are taken away from us, when our positions are taken away, a job, or when the markets crash, when your plans are changed like Daniel, what do you do with that? And how have you grieved through this? And what do your grief reveal? In his best-selling novel, John Green writes this, Grief does not change you. It reveals you. You see, loss, crisis, unwanted circumstances don't change you. Those things reveal you. What have you learned during this pandemic about your idols? Some of us have handled this pandemic better than others because we have a secure identity in Christ. Our identity is not found in what we do normally or some habit or in our ability to do or produce or, or, or how about this, what we look like or even who we are, who God is in us. See, you must hold on to your identity, hold on to your provider. But look what happens next. In verse 8, he asked the authorities, verse 9, he asked them if he could not eat the king's food, verse 8. And then in verse 9, and God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And Daniel then offered a wise proposal in verse 12. He says, hey, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths, the others who eat the king's food, be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. And, and he agreed. God gave him favor. And in verse 15, Daniel and his friends came out looking better, bigger, stronger than the others supernaturally because they, 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 they held on to their provider. I mean, how does a vegan, right, gain weight? How does a vegetarian look bigger, stronger? And the steward gave them vegetables and water provided by God. They didn't have to worship, if you will, with them. Hold on to your identity. Hold on to your provider as you move into this new normal. And finally, hold on to your purpose. Look what happens. In verse 17, all these four youth gave, God gave them learning. Look at the, God gave them favor. God will give us favor in the new normal as we seek to live in exile, live in Babylon. God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all these visions and dreams. And they brought them before the king. In verse 18, and there were none like them. In every matter of wisdom and understanding, they were 10 times better than all the others. It says in verse 20, and then the chapter ends with verse 21 that says, and Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Now, we're going to track this because by the end of chapter one, this is Daniel. He says he has served now at the end, by the end of the book, four different kings over the course of 70 years. How did he do it? 
How do you remain faithful for 70 years? And now we're reading about this man. He did it like you do anything. He did it one day at a time. What is the purpose of your life? See, your singular purpose. What is your purpose above all purposes? What is success for you? You know, I've talked about this in recent days because I've thought so much about it. Success is faithfulness. Faithfulness every single day. Because you see, life takes place one day at a time. And to be a faithful presence before God, his presence in us, and then to be a faithful presence wherever he places us, before whomever he puts us to be faithful. Daniel was faithful every single day because days become weeks, weeks become months, months become years, and years become a lifetime. Success for you and I tonight as we lay our head on the pillow will be that we were faithful to God who is always faithful to us. See, Daniel didn't start out. He didn't set out and say, I'm gonna gonna just serve longer than any of them. No. How did he do this? He did it one day at a time. Look, your faithfulness does not depend on who you are. Depends on who God is. Your faithfulness does not depend on where you are because God is wherever you are. Your faithfulness does not depend on how you are. That is how you feel or how old you are, how smart you are, how young you are. Because you see, many of us, you might even be thinking, well, I'm not real faithful to God today. I don't feel like being faithful. I don't feel like God's faithful to me. There's your problem. You're basing your life on your feelings, not faith. And it's the object of your faith that matters. He's faithful. He's always been faithful and he will always be faithful. So here we are in this new normal. And it feels like we're so far from home. This world is broken and we sense it, it seems more and more in these days. We live in a broken world. I read a New York Times op-ed article entitled, How We Broke the World. The Bible tells us our sin has broken the world. These can be discouraging days. But the good news of the gospel is not simply that God is faithful to those who are faithful to him. It's that our Savior has come to rescue faithless and compromised people like us. See, our salvation rests not only in our ability to, to, not not in our ability to remain undefiled from the world, but, but it rests rather in the pure and undefiled offering that Jesus has provided in our place. Jesus was not pulled out uh, as a prisoner into exile. He came voluntarily. He came into the world with all of its pain, all of the trial. He came voluntarily into our world. And he even faced death itself. He endured far greater temptations than Daniel or you and I will ever face. He's the greater Daniel. In fact, in Hebrews 4, 15, it says, we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted and yet without sin. He remained entirely faithful, pure to the very end. See, you're not saved by the things of this world, by your good works or by being like Daniel, but by the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, and he grants the perfection of his obedience to you and to I by faith. Jesus has already returned from his time of exile and now sits at the right hand of the Father. He has already prepared our places, and his presence there already assures and guarantees that one day, We will join him there to be where he is. He's coming again, he says, to take us to be where he is. And the cross, friends, is the only means by which God's faithfulness redeems the faithless like you and like me. His resurrection and his ascension are the seal, the certainty of our inheritance in heaven. So as we move into this new normal, listen, fix your eyes on Jesus him crucified, raised, exalted, trust in his faithfulness. He has put you, listen, in a place 
for you to be faithful, to be a faithful presence in your home, in your family one day at a time, to be faithful back at school someday, back to light up your workplace. He's placed you where you are today. He's faithful, regardless of what happens in your life. And all the while, continue to long for the day when His heavenly kingdom will invade this earth and bring the fullness of your inheritance. This exile will end. And until then, Hold on to your identity. Hold on to your provider. And hold on to your purpose. One day at a time. I want us to pray together. And I want us to just close our eyes now and fix your eyes on Him. Hold on to Jesus. Friend, if you don't know Him today, I want you to commit your life to Him with your head bowed and eyes closed. Just say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Thank you for creating me. Thank you for, for being my Savior, for coming and dying on the cross for my sin. I receive your gift of forgiveness now by faith. And I praise you for it. Make me the person you've called me to be. And if you do know him today, be resolved. Be resolved no longer to linger or charmed by the world's delight, the things that are higher, things that are nobler. Maybe they've allured your sight, as the old hymn writer wrote. So we turn to Him. Hasten to Him. Run to Him. Jesus, greater, higher, better. He is our Savior. Come to Him as we live out the new normal that He's called us to in Him. We love you, Jesus. We give you our lives. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, if you've prayed that prayer, if you'd like someone to pray with you, I want you to just text the name Jesus right there and we'll reach out to you. We're ready to serve you any way that we can. But hold on to him, friends, this week. Whatever comes our way, he's faithful. And don't forget that as you follow Jesus throughout this week to come.